It's science fiction at the moment. It's doable when the economics are right. And at some stage, we will become a space-going race. That's inevitable. And asteroids are an essential part of that transition. OK, well, this group, Planetary Resources, think they can do it within 10 years. Now, that does sound fanciful. Oh, but you've got some real heavy hitters, though, haven't you? In that well, group. Well, you're talking about lots of money. Yeah, lots of money. And they're, and they're big companies, too, aren't they? Let's say they can. They have the, the technology that can do this. Not yet, but they will. No, let's assume that they do. Yeah. What will they be mining and why? OK. Um, our Earth is relatively deficient in minerals. So the Earth started, we have to go back in time, four and a half billion years ago. The Earth forms, it collapses with a big solar cloud, and all the heavy stuff sinks to the bottom of the Earth. And then about four billion years ago, we had what they called the early heavy bombardment. So the Earth had cooled down a lot. It was no longer totally molten all the way through. The surface was cooling down. And all these asteroids started hitting the Earth. That's where we get a lot of our raw materials from. And they're still up there in those asteroids. So we'd be mining, for example, if you were to mine something like an asteroid called 16 Psyche, that has enough iron and nickel to supply the human race for 20, you know, no, so for millions of years. If you mine a small one, 100 metres across, that would give us enough iron and nickel worth uh, $20 trillion. And there are other ones that we have good reason to believe, other asteroids, that are rich in platinum, in gold, and other what are now called rare metals, but obviously won't be rare. Now, obviously, an advantage of doing it on an asteroid is there's virtually no gravity. So, yes. so getting the, the minerals, the heavy rocks off there, not a problem. But of course, you've got to still have to get down to Earth. Yes. Well, or unless you be, we become a space going race. The hardest part well, of... We manufacture things in space, you know. Yes, manufacture things in space. So you could use the stuff that you get, firstly, as raw materials to build more stuff. Secondly, you can use the oxygen and the water to do life support for human beings. And then thirdly, you can use it to make rocket fuel. So we would become a space-going race, uh, surprisingly pushed by private enterprise. I think 10 years is a bit optimistic, but I can see us heading down that way where we live totally in space. We've also got to talk about the economics. If you're talking about mining rare minerals mm. at a mass scale, they might be rare on Earth, but you bring them down to Earth and there's suddenly a heap of them. The economics of doing that is no longer quite so attractive, is That's it? That's right. So the people who are fabulously wealthy because of their mining connections suddenly become not so wealthy and the people who help get those minerals become more wealthy. But at the moment, it's undoable because at the moment, right now, 2012, it costs $10,000 to take a kilogram of anything into orbit, ten dollars to $20,000. We've got to get a better way of going into space, which is the space ladder hooked into a geostationary satellite, and we can do that probably in about five to 10 years using carbon nanotubes. The next thing is to get us mining these asteroids, living in the asteroids and becoming a space-going race. And it might just happen suddenly, it might just tip over if the economics are good. Now, I should ask you exactly how many asteroids there are out there, and, and I guess we're talking about the asteroid belt. Okay, asteroid which, what, belt between or, Mars and Jupiter, yep. Okay. And what, about a million? Oh, it'd be of the order of somewhere between high hundreds up to a couple of million, depending on whether you count something the size of a TV set as an asteroid. So they range from a thousand, just under a thousand kilometres, a couple around 200 kilometres, and then they go down to the small rubble. And is it worthwhile mining something the size of a TV set? Probably not. But that's what exists out there. Now, Dr. Carl, asteroid 18412, what does that mean to you? That's my asteroid. Oh, very nice. That's mine. Rob McNaught, <laughs> who discovered, he's an astronomer, discovered McNaught's uh, comet. He named it after me. I've got 18412, named after me, uh, rather unromantic name, and 18413, which apparently is a prime number, is named after my colleague in the Sleek Geeks, Adam Spencer. So we each have our own asteroid, probably 100 metres in diameter in orbit between Mars and Jupiter, taking about five years to do an orbit around the Sun. And mine is more inclined than Adam, so obviously is worth more in resale value if the superannuation fund doesn't kick through. But it is just a lump of rock. Isn't it is it? a lump of rock, but this is, we're talking about a genuine aim. This is not you pay $10 and you get uh, a square metre of the moon or you get a star named after you. This is an official government thing. Go to 18412 on Wikipedia and you'll see that it's named officially after me and 18413. So you could be quite literally seeing on a gold mine. I could be, except I've got no way of getting there with our technology. At the moment, the best we humans have ever done is get to the moon. And we only got there six times. To get beyond the moon is impossible with our current technology. But if we go into this different way of doing things, self-replicating machines, becoming a space-going race and not coming back, this could be a whole different world.